burden we break by the architect's pen and the builder's sweat, the shoulders of our land abroad, there are figures on paper, there are buildings telling our stories. What do they say and what does it mean? With the one you will engage in battle, with the other you might waltz. For some it's a burden, for others it is a mother. The one is carried on her back, the other merely to tolerated. That's the core of, of the lyric. I don't know if you listen to that as an architect with a, with a spectacular career. Um, is, is that the essence of what you think architecture is about? Is it a battle or is it a waltz? <laughs> Uh, well, I think, you know, in the morning it starts out as a waltz and then you end up <laughs> battle-scarred by, by the evening. Um, so, uh, yes, I think it's, it's, it's a bit of both, you know. It's, um, because it's, it's, it's a very interesting profession looking from the outside. It's very left brain, it's very exact, and then there's a huge amount of creativity in it as well. And, and that's probably where the, where the battle happens, when you look at the budgets, when you work with, with clients, and I'm sure that's where the battle happens, around the boardroom table. Yes, well, you, you know, I think that I, I've always been interested in, in, um, in how other non-architects can express their interest in, in architecture, you know, literature and, and art, mm -hmm. music, for instance, and, um, you know, in a sense, uh, what you had tonight was the, the, the sort of waltz on the one hand and, and the sort of battle on the other hand. Mm. And, you know, I, I think um, uh, our workers uh, sort of reflects, reflects that because you get involved in, in, um, in, in, in sort of all over the whole spectrum mm. of, of, of sorts of uh, projects and so on that we work on. Interestingly, um Big dreams in a small city. Yes, a Boerling van Welkom. You come out of the gold fields and then you landed in Bloemfontein. Now we know as Bloemfonteiners, and I'm one as well, that quite often when we leave the city, you know, we become the punchline in a joke. You from where? We're Bloemfontein. And then people have a bit of a, a, a snigger. Yeah. Why would somebody, op with the obvious breadth and depth of your talent and creativity, why would somebody choose to follow a career path in a small city like Bloemfontein? Well, uh, I think an important factor is that uh, my father practiced here, and uh, you know, you, you get to the point, uh, you know, where he says, look, uh, here I go, uh, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to carry on, or, or do you want to go elsewhere? So, um, you know, I said, okay, well, uh, I went to the, uh, worked in, um, in Pretoria for a while and so on, and then I decided I'd come back and, you know, sort of give it a go. And here I am, you know, like. But also Bloemfontein afforded you incredible opportunities, which perhaps might not have happened in other large metropolitan cities, uh, in New York or Johannesburg or whatever. And just going through your, your career and your CV, which is remarkable, um, the one thing that pops out is the incredible balance that you maintain between heritage work, uh, historical work, preservation work, and really cutting edge modern architecture. Do you ever change hats when you're working in, in your studio and when you're planning and think this is where it has to fit in or that's where it has to fit in? Or does, is, is that what you do as an architect? You, you, you change hats easily. Well, I think that, you know, the, the two sorts of uh, if, if there is really, uh, um, if it's really uh, sort of divided, uh, but you know, our work in heritage has really uh, sharpened our sense of, 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 you know, being quite responsive to context and, and, and things like that. You know, you mentioned Valcom now, you know, I always try to, uh, to sort of downplay that one a little bit, but, um, uh, you know, when, 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 I came to Bloemfontein, uh, you, you know, I was surprised that you could find things here so old, you know, in, in, in Valcom, the only old thing you had, you know, was like bread or stuff like that, it was not anything uh, really old, old there, you know, and um, uh, my, my father uh, got involved in, um, 
in the restoration of a, of a church in, in um, I think it was in Fentersburg or something. And, uh, you know, gradually he, he got more and more involved in, in, in restoration work. And I just sort of got interested in history once again because I didn't realize there were, you know, there were wars and stuff in Europe and other places, you know, from school and so on. But, yeah. you know, when you're in a city and you discover that it's, it's got this sort of meat on its bones, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing. I, re I recall my father uh, reading just the other day letters he wrote um, uh, because he was annoyed with the way that the um, contractor uh, hung the chandelier in the, in the church, the big central light fitting. And, and uh, it, it ends with something like, may he also ha ha hang in a public place, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's valuable in this daily battle to, you know, sort of be able to not take yourself too seriously either. You know. But then, of course, the, speaking about this duality of history and future, you speak about um, the places of memory and the spaces of imagination. What exactly do you mean by that? Uh, in, in, in the sense that, that I use it here tonight, it's really, uh, you know, space is, is uh, just something that has a dimension, uh, you know, height, breadth and so on, but, but a place is really something that is or has been imbued with, with meaning. It's like living in a house for 20 years or you know, getting to a public sp space that, that has been appropriated over time by people. And you know, it's sort of part of, the of many off, people. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, looking at your uh, CV once again, you have three master's degrees, a master of architecture. Really? And I, it's absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then you did um, environmental uh, uh, management and you did uh, city and town planning, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, again, what puzzles me or tickles me is this issue, should one specialize as an architect or, or are you just intensely curious about the concentric circles that sort of flow out of a building or out of a city or out of an area? Is, is it curiosity or are you a real true academic? Well, the, 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 like everything, there are more than one answer to that question. Uh, the one is, of course, is whenever I started speaking about a PhD, then my wife would remind me of the five years it will take to, uh, to, to do this. And then, you know, uh, the second answer would be is I think really that PhDs and with all due respect to my colleague Hendrik Oret. So I think that uh, you know, doctorates are wasted on architects because you, 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 an architect should know more and more by, about more and more things. And you, know, you, you always, when you go to these graduation ceremonies, you hear about someone who studied this little beetle on some little plant or something. And that's, that's, I mean, it's great to know a lot about that. I mean, if you... Uh, if you don't know what to say at a cocktail function or something, it's really, you know, you could ease in with something like that. Uh, could could really liven up the conversation. You know. uh. So yes, I, you know, you know I, th I think it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's great and we need to do that. But, you know, I tend to wander off in other directions and then, you know. Interestingly, speaking of that, um, you have a very lively interest as a collector and also as an artist yourself, as a collective art and as an artist, um, it really seems that, uh, you know, it's, f for you it's about the breadth and, and uh, the depth as well, but obviously the breadth. Listening to you, Anton, and having a daughter who's an architect as well, why would young people want to study architecture? The economy is shut, um, people are struggling to find jobs, construction is in trouble, um, why, if, if I came to you and I was a young person, I said, Anton, I will be a architect. Would you say yay or nay? And whatever your answer would be, why would you say that? 
Uh, I think it's a, the most wonderful profession. You know, it's, uh, it, it takes you places where, where few other people can ever go. And, um, you know, you, you literally can sit at the feet of kings. Uh, you can get involved in, 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 in all sorts of issues that you are particularly interested in. And, um, uh, of course, there are the, the, it's not just a romantic thing. There are other, um, other issues as well. Uh, the, the building industry is a, is, a, is a sort of a tough place to operate in and it has its own sort of um, issues. So, you know, I take my hat off to people like Jan Loebscher who managed to, to design these enormous projects and to keep that whole thing together is, uh, is just fantastic and, and, and I mean, it's an inspiration to see um, someone uh, being able to, to conceptualize on that sort of scale and to get this thing executed. Mm. And uh, it's, you know, you can, you can uh, be a one-man show and, and, and design a few houses uh, or, or uh, you know, and, and or you can get involved in huge projects as we've seen uh, today from Friso uh, and Meccano and so on. It's, it's wonderfully inspirational. You've done both. Do you have a preference? I've done? You've done big projects, yes. mega projects, and you've done smaller a very elite, elite projects. Do you have a preference or do you like them all? I, I always find that the pro projects that give you the most problems is that garden wall for your friend that you said you, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> you end up not speaking to each other for five years, you know. <laughs> uh, you didn't get any fees and you thought you're just going to do this quickly and so on and it just, they just keep on coming back because <laughs> the paint is peeling off the walls. And, you know. Somehow you, you, uh, you and the contractor gets uh, sort of superimposed and you, you become the contractor and it's your fault and so on. So, uh, um, but of course, uh, you know, we, we have a, a firm policy if it's, if it's a small project or a big project um, as far as in a small city you can do big projects, uh, we, we, we give it the same sort of attention for, for that very reason. If you say yes, you must uh, you know, do your best uh, as if it is the, a, a huge commission. You mentioned something that I actually want to, to, to introduce now. Um, how would you describe the DNA of the Ruit Architect firm? Because it does extraordinary work. What, what do you think is your unique selling proposition? What's ma what makes you different? Is it you? Don't be over, overly uh, uh, sensitive about it. But what is it that makes your work stand out, consistently stand out? Well, I, I, th I firstly have to say, of course, the, the people that work with us, um, uh, you know, they, they are all very special people and um, uh, that without them, of course, you can't do anything. And, and I've, had, I've had the good fortune of, of, um, of, of having great people working uh, in our office uh, over the years and I'm now basking in their glory, basically, but, you know, the year I am. But uh, I, I remember years ago, uh, my wife, came to me and said that there's this guy, Jan Loebscher, who, um, who is looking for a holiday job. So I said, no, look, uh, we don't want anyone now. And she said, no, but come on, you know, this, his, his mother says he's quite good. And, you know, so, I said, no. <laughs> so eventually I caved in and, uh, you know, we worked together for five years. And, and, and just as an example, there are other people, uh, I'm just thinking now, uh, Eugene Duplessis is in Australia now, Lizette Vessels I spoke to the other day, she's success successful in somewhere in, in Scotland and so on. So, um, uh, I, th I think that's the first thing. But uh, the second thing I think is, 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 is really, I mean, not everything that you do is, is great architecture, but we at least try to do it with the, the, the utmost integrity that we can feel we can offer, you know. You use the word integrity. Somewhere you actually said or wrote that architects are sellers of dreams. 
Is that the core of what you think you do? You sell a dream, you create a dream for people to live in and around? Uh, yes, I, th I, I think that, you know, that's a sort of uh, Kahnian idea, you know, that this, uh, uh, you know, people want to build these things and, you know, they, they show with their hands and they, heaven forbid, even when they start drawing little sketches and so on, um, uh, you know, so you have to get inside their dreams somehow. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that idea that Khan had of, of, it starts out as a something immeasurable and then it becomes all, uh, you know, lines and measurements and, and, and brickwork, and then it returns to, to something, uh, you know, that has a sort of a dreamlike quality when, when people actually inhabit the spaces. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for an exceptional purveyor of dreams, Anton Ritt, and we're going to hear him give the lecture now. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is a lecture or a sermon. This thing feels like a bit of a, <laughs> like a pulpit. I suppose this is what an Anglican minister feels like every Sunday. But anyway. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've always wanted to use the word brevity in the introduction to a talk. I did so recently at the opening of an art exhibition and uh, wanting to let the audience know that um, I'll be brief in my introduction of the artist. I referred them to Dorothy Parker's admonition that brevity is the soul of lingerie <laughs> and met with neither a titter nor the tweet. <laughs> Sadly, it seems like the word lingerie has left civilized conversation. I'm convinced that Sophia Gray knew it also, but only used it under special circumstances. I hope this talk about our work will be brief enough to <clears throat> reveal just enough to keep you interested, and where it does not, it is because I want you to respect me in the morning. <laughs> the architect, as Kuni pointed out earlier, is a dealer in dreams. This notion came to me when I chanced upon the word onaeropolist. That is someone who sells dreams for money. Personally, I prefer on a roscopist. That is someone who interprets dreams. The very talented among us can send dreams to their clients. Then we are on a rompumpists. Now, I just know this word was, uh, I came to my attention via Willem Bos of the artist, and I can assure you, you can only find it in the greater Oxford uh, English dictionary, the one with the 22 volumes. Our dreams, uh, sorry, the Jungian psychoanalyst Bosnak believes that dreaming is the purest form of imagination that we know of. He describes how a dream instantaneously presents a total world, so real that you are convinced you are awake. Our dreams are about, are about two subjects mainly people and places. As architects, we try to imagine how people will be in spaces. What will they ache for? The human body gives dimension and orientation to space, but it is our determination to dwell that makes architecture real. This is when place emerges. Thus, to paraphrase Claire Cooper Marcus, at Root Architects, we try to dream about places as if people mattered. Or if you wish, we think about people as if places mattered. So tonight I'll talk about some of these dreams, those of our clients, as well as my own big dreams in the small city of Bloemfontein. And by small I mean not as big as Johannesburg or Cape Town. 
Many years ago, the late Rudolf Eitenburger told me that one of the most important decisions an architect can make is where to set up his practice. Sometimes you do not choose consciously. I returned to Bloemfontein for personal reasons, and I have been fortunate to be involved in projects that seemingly in other more desirable parts of South Africa would not have been possible. My talk will be in two parts. Firstly, our work that could be considered part of the past of Bloemfontein that I will call places of memory. And secondly, projects that are in a sense part of the future of the city, which I have denoted spaces of imagination. The former suggests architecture with historical connections and the latter architecture that could enable latent possibilities. Regarding places of memory, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. This is from the go-between. This idea alerts us to the fact that the past is unknowable. We do at least have historical versions of the past, albeit written up by those with an objectivity shackled by the prejudices and fashions of their time. It is architecture and the city that silently testifies to the past. It is to these places and buildings that we are ushered when words fail the tourist guide and the past becomes opaque. When we are there, scale, dimension, and apticity are added to our reimagining of the past. Alejandro Aravena refers to the double condition of cities. This is another way to describe the apartheid city and its legacy. Cities attract people, knowledge, development, and opportunity on the one hand, and on the other hand, they concentrate and make, magnify social pressures. In South Africa's case, this divided condition has a spatial dimension that has resulted in cities that, with suburbs and precincts that might as well be foreign countries, even to residents of the same city who visit them. Such is the nature of Bloemfontein, best illustrated by the contrast inherent in President Brown Street on the one hand and the Vaya precinct on the other. In this talk, I will use President Brown Street and Vaya as points of reference, but we'll come to that later. Those of you who attended uh, Henrik Oret's uh, talk this morning um, can maybe recall some of these maps. In the latter half of the 19th century, people in the Free State squabbled, in the Free State Republic, I should add, squabbled over land and diamonds and tried to act out the manners, lifestyle, and affectations of their counterparts in another continent. The defeat of the Anglo-Boer South African War forced the Afrikaner and who else was here into submission. Black people hardly featured in contemporary accounts of these events. At best, they were shadowy figures or specters existing on the edges of towns or in the margins of memoirs. The people who lived here had one thing in common though. They dreamt of making this town a habitable place. For some, it meant a large, double-story mansion with mature willows and fruit trees. For others, a neat mud brick house in a bleak landscape. And so, by the first decade of the 20th century, material prosperity and freedom for some became more or less established. For others, hardship, frustration, and disappointment stretched out beyond the horizon. For the purposes of this discussion, of this part of our work, the history of the Free State plays out against a background that is partly republican and partly colonial and focuses on the city of Bloemfontein. As a city today, Bloemfontein is part of a collection of urban settlements grouped together as a metropolis. The historical, social, and political differences between these three conurbations of Bloemfontein Bochabello and Tabanshu that constitute the Mangung Metropolitan Municipality could not be greater and call for discussions on a different occasion. And now we come to my first point of reference, President Brown Street, which I believe is waiting 
to be rediscovered. The legacy of Republican and Colonial Bloemfontein in terms of architecture is a rather splendid street with a number of fine sandstone buildings that were commenced in the Republican period and that was added to over the next 50 years or so. These buildings symbolize the concentration and centralization of Republican political power that was conveniently appropriated after the Anglo-Boer South African War by the colonial victors and extended during their occupation. Against this backdrop, we come to the new government buildings, which were erected to accommodate the budding Free State Republic's administrative functions. So by 1880, the Free State as a Republic and Bloemfontein as a town were entering maturity. Despite the loss of the diamond fields, the Republic was financially sound. The 90,000 pounds that was received as compensation for the diamond fields made various building projects in the province possible. One of these was the new government offices that were erected at the top of Maitland Street and what, that was designed by the German architect Richard Wocker. These offices, although at the western edge of the town, was the first of a series of institutional buildings that would, in time, be erected in President Brandt Street, which came to be described as one of the most beautiful streets in South Africa. The vision for the street came, uncharacteristically, from a land surveyor, Gustav Baumann. In 1881, he laid out New Irvine to the west of the town. He noted especially that he made President Brown Street 103 feet wide, which is much wider uh, than normal, as you can see on the photograph. After the turn of the century, the firm of Baker and Macy were approached to enlarge the government buildings. The Lieutenant Governor Gould, uh, Hamilton Gould Adams was a personal friend uh, of, of Baker or other, the other way around, and the additions were completed in 1906. But on Wednesday afternoon, 28 October 1908, probably due to electrical fault, a fire ignited and the building was largely destroyed. Fortunately, not one civil servant was injured because they were all out doing sport. <laughs> of course, nowadays there are, uh, there are not even any pretensions about that. So, the government architect Frank Taylor eventually redesigned the building, which was noted in the press as being modern renaissance. Our involvement with the government buildings, which currently accommodate the National Afrikaans Literary Museum, commenced in 1992. Our initial brief was really just to repair water leakages and damage caused by blocked rainwater goods. The project subsequently evolved into a full-scale rehabilitation program which was eventually completed in 2008. The Literary Museum is incidentally also the custodian of early Afrikaans films, and to this end we suggested that the blank wall of the uh, archive block be used as a cinema screen, and uh, it's now become a regular occurrence during Bloemfontein's balmy summer months. Sadly, the courtyard is once again in need of maintenance and repair. My discussion now moves on to two key buildings in President Brown Street, both of which came into being by means of competitions. Two architectural competitions were promoted by the government during the early 1880s. Architects were invited to submit designs for a new president's house, as well as a new Ratsal or legislature building. The competition attracted entries from all over the world. And surprisingly, both competitions were won by the same firm of architects from Queenstown. Lennox, Canning, and Goad. Goad was later killed in a duel in Johannesburg, and there was uh, some suggestions of uh, an, another man's wife and so on. So all the details are a bit sketchy, but architects get involved in all sorts of things. Um, the original design for the presidency was a rather elaborate affair, 
And some of the parsimonious members of the Volksrat condemned it and said it was far too beautiful for the Free State. And the amount voted for the construction of the presidency was quite limited, and the architect had to implement radical cost-saving measures. Consequently, in its final form, the building was only a shadow of its former Scottish baronial splendor. Yet, in its complete guise, it is decidedly something of the free state, although a set of serious technical challenges also remained. Our firm started work on this project in the early 1970s, and the first restoration of the building was completed in 1985. Uh, 1885, exactly 100 years after its original completion. Further work, mainly to the roof, was undertaken by us and completed in 2002. A project that has close ties with the presidency, being situated on the same site, is a branch of the Reserve Bank for Bloemfontein. And for that reason, I mentioned it here before moving on to the fourth Ratzel. It is a dream project in many ways, but the design constraint, constraints are severe. If the security of, of the of bank expert securities, uh, sorry, if the bank security experts had their way, the building would be a concrete box without windows and doors. The project is still underway and has survived three bank governors thus far while we have investigated 18 complete design options until now. In our view, the building could fulfill an important role in consolidating the institutional character of Markgraf Street. Contextually, it also has a responsibility to the presidency, and although the footprint of the building is large, we try to relate it to the presidency in terms of height, width, silhouette, material, and textures. The crowning glory of the Free State Republic's building program is certainly the Fourth Ratzel, or legislature building that was completed in 1893 after the prize-winning design of Lennox, Canning and Goad. President Reitz was eager to have the building constructed and he probably favored Canning's design because of his own interest in American democracy. Once again, the actions of the tight-fisted Volksrat resulted in a building project that was underfunded from the start. Furthermore, the drawings by the architect, who had now moved to Johannesburg and had a flourishing practice there, left much to be desired as far as detail and structural integrity were concerned. A hostile relationship developed between the client and the architect, and several building contractors went bankrupt before the well-known South African contractor and brickmaker, Kirkness completed the building. As an example of the relationship between the architect and the client, I could note that the architect, for some reason that's not explained anywhere, decided to add a small statue of Mercurius on the flagstaff on the dome of the fourth Ratzel. And when the members of the Volksrat realized that Mercurius was inter alia, the god of liars, they were furious. <laughs> and one cannot actually repeat the tone of the telegrams that flew back and forth between architect and the government secretary. Eventually, the little statue ended up on the gable of the newspaper, The Express, and the rival newspaper, The Friend, gleefully announced, in its rightful place at last. <laughs> so, in 2003, we were und undertook some repairs and upgrading to the building. Um, severe damage was caused by water leaks, and, uh, and, and ceilings and walls bore the scars of consecutive downpours that rotted floorboards and caused the wood graining, uh, simulated by a paint technique, to peel and led to serious damage to items of furniture that were specifically designed for the building. Apart from repairing damage, the legislature, in its contemporary guise, has functional dictates relating to meetings, audiovisual equipment, recording and translating facilities, as well as sound attenuation. 
The air conditioning system also required a complete overhaul. Other than the old presidency, we also became involved with other houses that are deeply entrenched in the city's history and political history, social and political history, the first of which is the JBM Herzog House. Prior to its restoration, the house of JBM Herzog was used as a pastorie or manse by the Tweeturing Church in the CBD of Bloemfontein. After an endowment, the residence was completely and comprehensively restored in conjunction with the National Museum. Herzog is well known for his political views, but it is sometimes forgotten that he was one of the founding members of the Nationalist Party. The event took place in the Ramblers Club in Bloemfontein in 1915. The house was erected in 1895 and in terms of design is a typical late Victorian house with a bay window and verandas on the north and east sides of the house. From the late Victorian era, we moved to House Mapikela, which also has significant, style, significant ties to contemporary South African history. By day, Thomas Mapikela was a successful building contractor, carpenter, and cabinet maker. He reputedly built several imposing residences in the white areas of Bloemfontein and eventually constructed for himself and his family a comfortable double-story residence in Batu. It should be noted that he had, he had property in the, the township of Vayuk and uh, was then, all the people were moved to Batu. And the house in Batu he called Ulundi Kaya. Mopikela persuaded the municipality to allow him to take in lodges as black people had no other place to stay when they visited Bloemfontein. He was, however, by night and during his free time, active in local black politics. Eventually, he became one of the founding members of the African National Congress, which was, like the Nationalist Party, also established in Bloemfontein. Unlike Herzog House, the Mopikela House remained largely unaltered until 1994, when one of the first stops by the late President Nelson Mandela uh, was a visit to Bloemfontein and to the house of Thomas Mopikela. As a gesture of goodwill, he arranged for the house to be plastered. This compromised the character and quiet dignity of the house. Soon hereafter, the house burned down and the structure was seriously damaged. This afforded the opportunity to replace the external brickwork. In 2012, we became involved in a post-restoration project that included maintenance work and upgrading of the utilities on the inside of the house. As the family still occupies the house, a small exhibition space was added at the back to allow some of the items that belong to Mopikela to be exhibited along with photographs. From House Mopikela, we moved to a historical stable building that was born again as a house. The farm Tempe has for the last 110 years or so been associated with the military. Farm originally belonging to Andrew Hudson Bain and later became the property of Joseph Allison, secretary to Henry Warden, the founding father of Bloemfontein. The old manor house of the farm still exists today and as part of the farm buildings, there was an old stone stable that we were approached to convert into a residence for a bachelor. The barn was used for tanning leather and shoeing horses, and according to the locals, the holes in the corrugated iron roof were caused by boisterous British soldiers firing off their guns after drinking one toast too many to the good Queen Victoria. The stone floor formed a channel through the center of the structure and the smell of leather, grease, and horse manure still lingered there on our first visit in 2002. We proposed a freestanding insertion into the uh, existing structure. Uh, the staircase leading up there, you can see the, um, 
the mezzanine level there, while the rest of the lower level was retained as a kitchen, dining, and living space. The arrangement changes according to the seasons. A set of new windows were punched into the stone walls with a different rhythm to the existing. We also retained the memory of the stormwater channel by placing a row of blue fluorescent lights under a rector grid in the floor. The two final projects singled out for discussion in this part of my talk are two recent buildings. The first being a regional office for the Department of Public Works. For as long as I could remember, there was a vacant plot of land in President Brown Street opposite the Synod building of the Dutch Reformed Church. In 2005, we were appointed to design a new building for the department, and it was the client's wish that the building should recognize the context of President Brown Street. Conceptually, we utilized the organization of the planning of the other historical and mainly institutional buildings in the street, but in a physically more accessible manner. These buildings are typically approached from uh, the sidewalk via, uh, you see the sidewalk there, and then there's normally a sort of a, 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 a columns and a courtyard, and then a series of internal, of internal spaces, and they ought to seem to work more or less like that. The offices at the new building, as much as possible, were restricted to four stories along the edges of the site, so that the massing at street level would correspond with the adjacent buildings, and then the higher section of eight stories were situated in the center that was less visible, that is less visible from the street. Other references to the street include the treatment of corner elements and the roofs, the roof over the central section is curved and accommodates mechanical equipment and is at the same time accentuates the more um, important spaces on the top floor. Stone and brick work are used here in combination, but in this instance the, stro the stone is a curtain wall veneer, it's quite thin, and double glazing has lowered the energy demand in the building. Bloemfontein is the judicial capital of South Africa, and President Brown Street is closely associated with law in South Africa. The High Court, Appeal and Magistrates Courts are located here. We were involved in extensive additions and rehabilitation work at the High Court. In 2006, a firm of attorneys approached us to design a building to accommodate the offices, and they wished to be associated with what they felt was the air of dignity of the historical sandstone buildings in the street, but with a more open aspect. The concept, which was prepared at short notice, was accepted unanimously and without alterations. And such is the nature of architectural work. There are so numbingly dull courtships that sometimes last for years and are never consummated. And then there are others like this one, which was brief and serendipitous. President Brown Street and its institutions have changed and transformed. In David Goldblatt's parlance, structures of dominion have become structures of democracy. Yet despite frequent national coverage in the media and various local and provincial tourism bodies, it remains inexplicably an undiscovered cultural gem. My talk now moves to its second part, spaces of imagination. These are projects that mainly deal, mostly deal with new work, and interventions yet tend to alter the nature and context of the places that were before, be it a vacant site or a ruin. Over time, these interventions once again become part of the places that make up the city. Spaces of imagination are about the future of the city, the nature of space and places, though, if we think about people who will use them, are linked to the nature of human beings. The nature remains more or less constant over time. However, the way in which we define these spaces in future will be different. Quite often our newer work is located in areas that suffer from a lack 
of contextual and spatial references or markers. Though these spaces are not devoid of meaning, they are often without qualities that could sus would sustain higher order needs. Urban design and architecture have the potential to unlock, unlock these qualities in a balanced socio-economic environment. When spaces are designed with care, that is considering who you are designing for, places will emerge that will bring out the best in people. It is then that you think about people as if places mattered. Our own office, the domicile of Ruet Architects, is such a place of imagination. In 2000, we moved from the suburb of West Dean to new offices on the outskirts of the city. We bought the property of seven hectares from the estate of the late architect Fricky Horn. He called himself the Graf of Grobler's Hoop. <laughs> With only minor changes, we converted this modernist bungalow into our offices. We liked the fact that the house could so readily become something else. And I tell you, uh, last Friday, um, it nearly did become something else. Um, there was this huge fire, and uh, if it weren't for those people, part of our staff, uh, half of the exhibition you will see tonight would not have been there. Uh, I salute my valiant firefighters. Just prior to the centenary celebrations of the ANC, we converted and added to the pool house and outbuildings of Free State House, the official residence of the Premier of the Free State. The pool house now has a small committee room and a guest house was established in the converted staff quarters. But if you want to design a palace for a king, you have to look elsewhere. In 2006, we were alerted by a colleague in Lesotho who told us about a tender requesting a design for a new royal palace for the kingdom of Lesotho. We visited the existing palace that really looked like a large suburban house, uh, well, let's say on ster steroids even, with a royal family occupying a few spaces on the northern side of the building where they huddled in the sunshine. When we discussed the design, the spokespersons for the royal household alarmingly expressed a desire for roofs in the shape of Basutu hats. From the outside, we were of opinion that the palace should not be a single structure, but rather a collection of contemporary structures organized much like a traditional tribal settlement. The spaces for royal functions would be separate from the chapel, the residence of the royal family and staff quarters and so on. The palace was ultimately designed by other architects and is surmounted by a glass Pasutu hat roof, a big dream for a small country. From buildings for a premier and a king, we moved to a community. The suburb of Lorir Park to the southwest of the city of Bloemfontein was earmarked for affordable housing, but lacked amenities that could service the community. In 2005, we were appointed to design a community center here. The center was workshopped with members of the community and the program called for a hall, clinic, library, creche and a small shop. These facilities were arranged around a courtyard space that also serves as seating for larger gatherings when the hall is used. The lack of an urban context an exposed site here necessitated an urban gesture that would create a physical focus. My talk will now focus on a different kind of community, namely a community with an academic context. Universities are small cities with big ambitions. The etymology of the word campus derives from, from the Latin that means a field. Campus planning therefore deals as much with buildings and facility as it does with spaces between buildings. The University of the Free State appointed a firm of planners in the late 1990s to prepare proposals for a campus development plan. 
The plan by Markowitz English was presented in March 2000 and amongst other things suggested that a student center should straddle the space between the east and west portions of the, of the campus, as you can see there, so that further academic development on the west campus could be integrated with the existing accommodation on the east campus. We approached the campus planning committee about the possibility of partnering with a private developer to construct a new student center. After a protracted design period, characterized by spirited crit sessions and numerous discussions with focus groups, ranging widely from students and teaching staff to representatives of the cleaning personnel, a design emerged. It became an inhabited bridge that linked the academic precinct with a library within casual walking distance. Suddenly, students who had heard rumors of a library far out on the West Campus <laughs> went to see for themselves. <laughs> the building is a connector and infill type building that emphasized the university's commitment to pedestrianize the central campus spine. And the driving force behind the pedestrian walkways on the campus was the late Bonnie Brits, who then headed the Department of Architecture. We subsequently assisted the university with developing ideas on how to guide the development on the West Campus, a project that was approved under the title of How the West Was Won, <laughs> to suggest the integration of the two parts of the campus. A notable project was to establish a new residential district that had ready access to the library and other academic facilities. Urban design guidelines were prepared by us and four architectural firms were appointed to design a student accommodation which has since been completed. At the Kwakwa campus of the UFS, the situation is quite different. Originally constructed in a drab face brick during the 1980s, the campus was conceived of with a low density program favoring the motor car. The campus lies on the outskirts of Pura di Chaba on an exposed plateau that is buffeted by icy military winds and the widely spaced buildings offer no protection against wind and sun during the hot months. Students have to commute from town and distances between buildings become pilgrimages rather than opportunities for academic and social interaction. Our involvement commenced with the consolidation of the residential precinct and proposals for the densification of the campus. The commuting of students required that the entrance to the campus became much more. It is both a transport interchange with informal shopping and a symbolic gateway to the campus with security function and, and ablution facilities. I now come to my point of reference in a different part of the city of Bloemfontein, from President Brand Street to Vajok. What remains in this corner of the city is akin to what the journalist Nathan Trantral calls the post-apocalyptic wasteland, the alternate reality of South Africa. This is the double condition of cities referred to earlier. Vajok. Damnatio memoriae, or waiting to be remembered. Although its disappearance was in a political sense inevitable because of its location, it took a disastrous flood to gradually erase the township of Vajok from the face of the earth. The Mongung Metropolitan Municipality, in conjunction with National Treasury, have embarked on an ambitious urban regeneration program for this area, now known as the Vajuk Precinct. Our involvement in this area started with the restoration of the Vajuk School, where the African National Congress was founded in 1912. The project then developed further to include the open space behind the school that was once Vajuk and later on became the sports fields of the erstwhile model school, now the Mateo College. In 1850, a black Wesleyan congregation was established in a small church in St. George's Street, 
which was also utilized for teaching black pupils to read and write. When it came to the attention of the city council that the Wesleyan church was utilized for a school and that that, that was not permitted, it was decided that the school should rather be situated in Vioc. The site offered to the church was part of the Bloemfontein townlands, undeveloped and situated on the lower slope of what is known as Fort Hill. The church was opened in August 1903. The Black Diocese, however, decided to construct also a school building on the same site with funds collected amongst themselves. By some remarkable turn of events, the school building is the only structure of Vioc that remained and is probably the most significant. The school building is cruciform in plan. It resembles a church more than a school building. The design probably aimed at more than one objective. The transepts could be used for smaller uh, teaching spaces, whilst the larger area could accommodate the whole school or could be utilized for teaching in smaller groups. Our work here is divided into two phases. The first phase comprises the restoring the school and adding a visitor center. In 1946, the original school building was extensively altered to accommodate a dry cleaning concern. And if you think about uh, uh, history laundering, so to speak, uh, <laughs> there's some sort of um, interesting parallel here. New windows and spaces were added over the years and the original windows were bricked up. So when we took off the plaster, you, you had all these um, bricked up windows and very little of the original material remained. And our only option to restore the main street facing facades was to replace the face brick outer skin. The wooden floor that had been removed was also replaced. The visitor center, which is not yet functional, took its design inspiration from the surrounding context and was kept visually unobtrusively, uh, unobtrusive by placing it uh, up against the site boundary where a previous warehouse was located. A portion of the adjacent Wesleyan Church's west facade was found uh, within the uh, remaining structures and was retained as part of the new building. In phase two, a multi-faceted program that geographically includes a portion of the eastern CBD of the city and also incorporates a vacant 3.2 hectare site that was previously part of the actual Vio township. Apart from the physical regeneration of the area, the socio-economic revitalization of the inner city is the main objective of the program. The strategy pursued by the main sponsors of the project, namely National Treasury, is to capitalize on the economic opportunities created by the triad of tax, taxi, bus, and rail commuters, especially as they move between these facilities. In this particular case, there is also the heritage dimension to be considered. Traditionally, the area directly north of the old Vioc was the shopping precinct of the township areas where formal commercial activities were not allowed. Today it retains some of its commercial functions, but other outlets in the city and closer to home have taken their toll on businesses and the area is in decline. In essence, our interventions range from enhancing accessibility, um, there in the background you can see there is a new bridge linking the CBD with a vast eastern hinterland uh, that will become a, a, a gateway to, into the city from the east and uh, it is scheduled to go out on tender soon. So our interventions without going into much detail range from enhancing accessibility, providing housing and amenities on a large scale. And in, in that sense, the people were removed uh, and, and, and moved to, to Batu, and now um, the proposals are to bring them back on a large scale um, to reactivate the area 
as well as I said earlier, the heritage potential of Hayek is also a priority on the agenda. I will conclude this talk with a brief reflection on my own big dream, the first house I built for my small family set against the slope of Naval Hill. When the notions of dream and house are brought together, the dangerous condition of the dream house arises. The dream house, says Bachelard, must satisfy both pride and reason, two irreconcilable terms. One might even say two inescapable terms, the extent of the hubris and the rigor of the reason only tempered by imagination and the policies of financial institutions. The making of this house has been long and difficult. To reimagine your own and the family's rituals in a new spatial environment required that the house be designed from the inside out. These spatial relationships find some embodiment in the plan and the sections. Once the house is completed, the architect departs. Then you become, as Claire Cooper Marcus describes in House as a Mirror of Self, part of the power struggles in making a home together with a partner. There are the issues of territory, control and privacy at home, self-image and location, and ultimately, hopefully, you develop beyond the house's ego to the call of the soul. We have gone through possibly six completely conceived, and in some cases even fully documented designs for our home, and in most cases on different sites too. During the process you are racked by insecurities, financial and otherwise, and beset by procrastination and indecisiveness, because your ego is determined to design along with you. In addition to the ego, there is the matter of accommodating personal passions in a new home, like collecting art and books. So, in an abstract sense, the idea of a series of box-like spaces, dark outside and light on the inside, informed my early ideas. In its realized version, the distinction between inside and outside is less definite, with darker tonalities on the outside which insist in merging the structure with the landscape and lighter tonalities on the inside, which complement the sketches and paintings and aid to the distribution of filtered sunlight. I can elaborate on practical concerns such as the measures implemented to ward off the looming crises of water and energy, but those are probably well entrenched in the design sensibilities of the day. Ultimately, a house is something else. As architects, we are ostensibly concerned with space and place, but home, as firmly stated in most quotes, is people, not a place. Yet, it is a place that allows one to dream in peace, as Bachelard says. In conclusion, when I joined Leon Root Partnership in 1982, I did not consciously choose Bloemfontein. Nonetheless, I have been able to dream big here. This is a city with huge potential. It no longer dozes, as a visitor noted in 1902. I am confident and excited that the work that we as local architects are doing here will enhance a metropole that presents many challenges, but also has much to offer. As principle of an architectural practice founded more than 60 years ago by my late father, and myself having turned 60 yesterday, I look forward to being part of the further shaping of a city that dreams of becoming a truly world-class African metropolis. I thank you for being here tonight, and thank you to those who collaborated me, with me on the projects that you have seen. Finally, thank you for the department, to the Department of Architecture for inviting me, and to those especially who made tonight a reality. Thank you.